Quite a few viewers have requested that I do a video all about how to machine a model steam locomotive driving wheel. So here is the video. I've taken a short break from painting my house to show how I would do it. The wheel casting was supplied by my friends at Blackgates Engineering and it's from a 210 austerity model steam locomotive. It's at times like this that I'm quite glad I don't have to machine 10 of these. I'm just going to machine the one and I'm going to show various different ways of doing it. And in order to machine this casting I do of course need a lathe and I'm using the larger of my two lathes, my old Smart and Brown Model 1024 and I'm currently changing the chuck from the normal four-jaw self-centering chuck to a very old four-jaw independent chuck. And the first thing to do is to clean any swarf that's present on the chuck back plate and the lathe register, otherwise the chuck won't run through. The chuck system on this lathe uses the cam lock system, which is a very quick way of fitting big heavy chucks onto the spindle. And at the moment this clip is showing me reversing the jaws because although the chuck is more than large enough to hold this driving wheel, the lathe only has a centre height of 6 inches, so the chuck jaws would just bash into the bed, which would be no good at all. Using a four-jaw chuck, particularly a large four-jaw chuck, is a good way of machining driving wheels, because the castings are quite irregular. If I was going to do a run of wheels just using bar stock, where all the pieces were the same size, I could use a three-jaw chuck, or maybe my four-jaw self-centering chuck. But I have to use a four-jaw independent chuck to get each wheel to run true before I machine it. And as all cast wheels vary slightly, it's very important to be able to make fine adjustments to get each wheel to run true before any machining takes place. I've made a few locomotives over the years and I've machined quite a few wheels. And I generally do it this way. There are other ways of doing it. I'm not saying this is the correct way. This is just the way I do it. I mount the casting in the four jaw chuck with the back side of the casting, pardon the expression, facing me. And with a little help from a dial test indicator, although it doesn't have to be a dial test indicator, it could just be a pointer, I'm attempting to make the casting run as true as possible in the chuck. The part that I'm interested in is the inside edge of the outer part of the casting, if you see what I mean. The centre part is unimportant. And apart from making sure that the inside edge of the outer part runs true, I need it to run quite true front to back. Otherwise, I may take too much off one side. There is, of course, a finished dimension to this wheel. In this case, I'm not concentrating on that because I don't have the drawing. I'm just making a locomotive driving wheel. And I'm only making one for no other purpose than to show how I do it. A quick note about machining cast iron. This video is speeded up almost all of it is speeded up, because if I ran it in real time, it would be far too long. You need to find a speed that your cutting tool and your lathe will cope with, with cast iron. Cast iron can be very difficult to machine, it's deceptive. One minute it's cutting like butter and the next minute it's really hard. So you have to get the speed and feeds quite right. I'm using a carbide tip tool in a lathe which has a very broad bed and it's very rigid. So really, machining speeds and feeds will vary relative to the type of machine that you're using. And the cutting tool I would use on cast iron is normally a round nose tool. Unless, of course, I have to cut up to a tight shoulder. Once the back of the wheel is machined, I can turn it round in the chuck. And once again, I'm spending a little time adjusting the chuck to make sure that the wheel runs true. To work successfully with an independent four-jaw chuck, where each jaw is fully adjustable, if you're a beginner to lathe work, you'll probably find that you will be adjusting the wrong jaw, so the work moves in entirely the opposite direction to where you want it to go, and it's very frustrating and quite annoying, but after a while, you get the knack. Once I get the wheel running true, I'm just checking how much material to remove, because I don't want it to be too small. I'm going to make this wheel about three quarters of an inch from front to back which is probably too big for 5 inch gauge. But as I'm making what is effectively a model steam engine unicycle, it really doesn't matter. The principle is the same. This particular wheel has the balance weight cast in. On some model steam locomotives, like a Highlander that I once finished off, the balance weights are two plates that are riveted through the spokes and filled with lead. In some ways this is easier, 
but with these cast in weights you have a problem you cannot machine part of the crank web what will happen is what's just happened the tool will hit the balance weight and make a thorough mess of it now I've done this on purpose because this wheel is of no consequence in any case this balance weight is sticking out a little bit too far I've left it like that so it's obvious what the problem is but it doesn't matter how far the balance weight sticks out if it sticks out a fraction of a millimeter the tool will still hit the balance weight if you attempt to machine the crank web in one go it's just impossible but do not despair there is a simple solution you have to be careful and you do need to practice and you do need a good sense of rhythm for this and as I'm a musician not an engineer I do of course have a good sense of rhythm so here's how to do it if you watch the video it is actually self-explanatory but what you cannot see is that I pull the cutting tool towards me by four thou just before it takes the next cut the four thou is based on the feed that I would use really most of the time and it seems to be about right if I take a bigger bite then there are going to be lines in the work so I'm just taking it nice and easy four thou pull it past the work slide it back another four thou pull it past the work and slide it back and so on and so forth if you get it wrong then you will break the tool and make a mess of it so you have to be careful and it's a really good idea to practice I would recommend that everyone buys just one locomotive wheel from wherever you may get it from and if you make a mess of it it's unimportant alternatively if you're going to build a locomotive such as a simplex buy seven drivers or if you're really bad at it buy eight that way you do have a margin of error you can wreck two of them but in the end you will still end up with six nicely machined wheels the first locomotive wheel I ever made I put it in the chuck the same way that I've shown previously with the backside facing out and once again pardon the expression I centre drilled and went through the back of the wheel and I felt quite smug I got a really nice neat hole it fitted the axle and then when I turned the wheel around it wasn't in the middle of the crank web so that wheel was scrapped and I made a mental note machine the back of the wheel but do not drill all the way through only drill all the way through the wheel once you've machined the back of the wheel and it's back in the forge or chuck running through and then everything will be fine and here I'm doing just that you've seen me centre drilling the front of the wheel followed by drilling it just under the size that I want it to be and I'm pushing a reamer through now which gives me an accurately sized hole through the centre of the wheel to get the size right you need to run the reamer quite slowly through the hole not too fast the faster you run the reamer the larger the hole will get but in this case the hole is too small so I'm putting the reamer through just a fraction faster and now the axle should be what's called an interference fit and this would be fine you could press it in using a large bench vise but I prefer the Loctite method how well I remember the first time I pressed a wheel onto an axle I had it in the bench vise, I was putting far too much pressure on it and the wheel cracked. So that was no good, so I made another. In those days I used to make about three of everything before I got it right. What I'm doing at the moment is showing an alternative way of making a hole through the centre of a wheel. I'm using a boring tool and I'm taking a very, very fine cut, it's actually squealing a little bit. But this is just another way of making the hole through the centre of the wheel. Boring a hole through the centre of the wheel is also very useful if you do not have the correct size reamer, which is often the case, particularly in the larger sizes, because they are quite expensive. The bigger they get, the more expensive they seem to get. So now this axle goes through the wheel and it's a perfect fit. It's a piston fit. If you're using a Loctite retaining compound such as 638, you do need a little bit of space between the axle and the wheel. Not a lot, a very, very tiny amount. To accommodate the Loctite. If the engineering is too good what's going to happen is when you put the axle into the hole it's going to push all the Loctite out and you will not get a strong bond. The rest of the machining operations I do on a mandrel and if I'm making a full wheel set all the tread machining operations are done at the same time on a mandrel. This was a mandrel that I used for some locomotive wheels I made a while back and I made this in a collet chuck and it was very accurate in the collet chuck and if I fitted it back into my collet chuck it would still be accurate but the problem is most people will not have a collet chuck like I have it's a really big thing so I'm going to show a different method 
I'm going through the motions of fitting this and you'll see that it's not true at all. The wheel's wobbling all over the place. It's a bit worse than I remember it. Just watch this. See what I mean? It's not really what I need it to be. So I'm going to do it a different way. I put a piece of bar in the chuck and I do know that this chuck is accurate. I don't know why that mandrel's not running quite as well as it used to do. And what I'm doing is centre drilling this piece of bar because it's vital that I put a live centre in the other end to support the work. Then I'm coating it with some Loctite 638 after which I'm going to press the wheel onto the axle using the tailstock. I simply bring the tailstock up to the work, lock it in place and turn the hand wheel. And the quill comes out and presses the wheel firmly onto the axle and keeps it in line, like this. By using the tailstock as a press, I make sure that the wheel is firmly pushed up against the chuck jaws. Then I would leave the tailstock in position, which I haven't shown on the video, until the Loctite cures. Then I would introduce a live rotating centre into the hole made by the centre drill, the cone-shaped hole of course. And then using a round nose lathe tool, I can machine the tread and the flange to the finished dimension. I would finish the job off by just removing the sharp edge of the tread using this tool. All I need to do now, after removing the axle from the wheel by just warming up the wheel with the blow lamp and tapping out the axle, is just remove all the sharp edges using some coarse sandpaper, after which I can paint the wheel. And as usual the painting is speeded up because it's a very slow process. Some people actually paint the wheels before they machine them, but I've never done it that way. I like to sort of paint around the nicely machined casting. Any paint residue that gets on the shiny part can be easily removed. These are some jigs that are made for different locomotive wheels, and I don't have one for this centre. This one's from a Simplex, which is a smaller centre, but you get the idea. You put the plug in the centre, and this gives you an accurate positioning of the crank pin hole. That way you can make sure that all of the crank pins are in exactly the same place relative to the centre of the axle. So there you have it. This is the original part, and this is what it looks like now. So if you're going to machine some locomotive wheels, there's nothing to worry about. It's very straightforward. You do get very dirty. Look at the state of my hands. No more white paint. It's now black cast iron. It's either one or the other. There are no grey areas in my life these days, just black or white. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.